Hello and welcome. My name is Corin Little and I'm organizer of Out of Sight Chicago. And today I'm in conversation with Regin Egloria. I am residing on the ancestral homelands of the Council of Three Fires, the Adawa, the Ojibwe, and the Patawatomi peoples. Out of Sight as an organization is particularly interested in the questions of ownership of land and site. And this is something that we're going to be addressing uh, in the conversation with Regin Egloria today, as it pertains to the elitism around nature and access to nature. It, the date, is Saturday, March the 13th. We are, we have been in lockdown in the USA for one year and two days. It has been a tumultuous year um, with political upheaval, uh, continued police violence against black and brown bodies, and and systemic racism and the ongoing um you know the real uh, tumultuous history um has really been it's been a time of reckoning for people in america and we hope as part of our conversation today we really want to delve into uh, these issues that um, as migrant black and brown bodies we um, experience. I am sitting here with Regina Gloria. Welcome. Thank you. Lovely to be with you. Thanks for having uh, me. Regin uh, was born in Manila, Philippines, and lives and works in Chicago. Regin is a multidisciplinary artist, and his drawings, artist books, sculptures, and performances portray the human condition as it relates to the natural environment and inhabited spaces. With several years of arts administration, teaching experience, and he founded North Branch Projects, an organization that builds connections through the book arts. He works with various communities to create crossover between disparate populations and cultures, aiming to broaden the roles of both artists and non-artists. Gloria has taught at space places like Marwin RISD, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, Snow City Arts, and Carthage College, where he is now. He received a Three Arts Individual Artist Award, as well as local, national, and international grants, supported through the artist residencies, and has exhibited internationally. He, has, he received his MFA from Rhode Island School of Design. So welcome, Regin. How are, how are you holding up after a year of lockdown? Thank you, Karen. I'm, I'm doing okay. You know, it's uh, obviously been a, an interesting and unique year, and I have settled into quite a bit of a routine, even though that, you know, saying something like that, is constantly evolving, um, and I'll—I <laughs> think I'll be talking a lot about that because a lot of the work that I do is about routine and, and sort of finding some sort of rhythm um, and balance with the the world around me. But yeah, you know, I'm fortunate to be employed and to be healthy, um, and doing a lot of drawing um, and running and trying to maintain some sense of of peace with <laughs> the world. So thank you for having me. It's just, it's actually been quite interesting to be in conversation and engage in a lot of conversation about my work, which I hadn't done before the pandemic, it seemed like for quite a while. So I appreciate being given this opportunity and I look forward to, to sharing all sorts of ideas. 
Thank you, thank you. So uh, we're going to start by sharing a performance that Regan did in 2010, uh, which was part of Anti Festival. And I just want to also uh, share with everybody that uh, the Anti Festival currently have uh, their deadline for this year's uh, proposals, and the deadline is tomorrow. So uh, do um, think about uh, looking at their the theme for this year is the face to face. I think uh, so. If you're interested in submitting a proposal, I know they extended their deadline till tomorrow. So. Um, but let me um, share. Was it? Was there a particular title to this work, Regin? It was called the Anti Ten K Run Right Run. Okay, here we go. Ja 50 rivillistä tarinaa tässä sitten syntyy. Hän on muuten juossut 24 maratonia, joka on joku tässä äsken kuulut. Päivän tarinassa, eli pari viimeisestä maaliin tuli. Ja saa nähdä päivän mittaan, että onko tuossa maaliviivan takana odotuksissa. Antti 10, antifestivaaliin kuuluva Antti 10, juoksu, kävely, hölkkä, sauva, kävely, tapahtuma. Ready, steady, go! No niin, ja näin lähtee kuntoilijajoukko liikkeelle. 10 kilometriä ensin Rönänsaari kierrestä, ja sitten käydään Kuukkilainen ympäristöä. Kaukkilainen jälkii kolmessa, ja ei tarvitse käydä enää Rönänsaari. It's green, let's see what will happen. Okay, in the end, nobody wins unless everybody wins 65 and 66 let's see what the lines will be pari uutta lausetta ilmestyy tuonne pieni hetken kuluttua ei muuta kuin yli sieltä näin tervetuloa maaliin tuolta löytyy vähän jotain mehuja ja muita virvokkeita sitten kaikille maaliin tulijoille toivottavasti ja nyt sitten nähdään mitä 23 ja 4 rivi tuovat tähän kirjeeseemme tarinaamme rohkeus rehellisyys ja rakkaus niistä on aito ihmissydä Kyllä Laura on innoissaan, kun hän tämän kirjeen saa. Tai lukee koko tämän tarinan. Kun numero 12 maaliviivan ylittää, number 12, and let's see what will appear on the scoreboard. Next part of the story. I got to find Baba. Seuraava tarinan pätkä kertoo meille pienen hetken kuluttua tuonne taululle ilmestyy. And this is the way how the story goes on. Olis pitänyt ajatella tätäkin asiaa aie. Annetaan aplaus. 29 rivi tulee. This is the 29th line in today's story. Hello, and so Regin, uh, do you want to share the the text that came from that? Yes, Let actually, I, I think I'll, I'll play poet for a little bit and uh, read a section of it, just so you kind of get an idea. Keep in mind, this was uh, initially about 63 lines long. And if you're interested in reading the entire text, you can go to my website and click on the on the piece and read the entirety of it. Anti 10K. Thanks for creating this very moment that I wish to taste more, to feel more, to be more just this once in our favor. In the end, nobody wins unless everybody wins. 
be true to who you are and have room for what you might become. Yes, Zui, you can do it. It is not about what is right, it is about what is fair. Happiness comes alive, not buying. I run for health and joy, leaving worries behind. As long as a foot rises, I'm glad I have been blown to life. I run, therefore I am. I run for real. Guilt, apathy, and hypocritical bliss. You would feel much better if you left this life alone. All the reasons that keep us from moving are excuses. I'm just going to skip down to the end here. Listening seems to be more important than anything else in my life right now. To listen to myself, my body, my mind, my soul, my gut, feeling, my heart. Right where we are unable to share, we share this non-sharing, this desire, this impossibility. And the fog is lying thick over the harbor. The seabirds are hiding and there is a slight wind disturbing the fallen autumn leaves on the ground. And suddenly, I'm sorry. I saw a hooded crow, jackdaw, magpie, jay, gull, mallard, golden eye, sparrow, gray tit, and something with a yellow tail, lintu, nearly. And that is a culminating line. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so you were just recently able to translate that from Finnish. And so there were some surprises in there for you. What were the surprises? Uh, well, I actually didn't read the one that I had just recently translated, um, but just that there was, you know, it, in, in these sort of interactive pieces where you leave it up to the participants to come up with a phrase or a line. And I've done this with projects through North Branch projects where people write in books um, in responses to questions. Um, you know, there's always some you know, I, I like to call them smart alecky sort of responses where people, depending on their mood, just want to be funny, you know, or um, times vulgar, you know, and then just have some kind of response. But that's their response. And so I respect it and kind of include it. But um, yeah, there, there are just some lines that, of course, if you look at the website, uh, the actual plotting out of the, of the lines, I would say half of them, or maybe three fourths of them, were in in Finnish. Um, so I had no idea. This Google Translate didn't uh, exist back in 2010. Um, so it was just recently when I tried to interpret some, but um, or translate them through that app. And of course, nothing is accurate exactly. Um, so there's a little bit of a funny uh, translation, like "eat dessert first, you know. Um, uh, Beloved, I'm a friend of salt and I'm a great consumer of it. You know, there's just these things that um, I think I had no idea was uh, was part of the sort of uh, the longer form of this text. So yeah, I'm going to continue, I was, to, do that. I'm gonna continue yeah. to translate them and maybe put the translation on my website for others to read. Yeah, I mean, I was struck by um, the real, the positive sentiment um, in the English texts uh, that were shared. And so do you want to, um, shall we bring up your presentation now? Yeah, I thought, and do you want I thought maybe I could talk a little bit about another piece and then we could go back and forth between, I'm sure, um, I mean, I do want to explain a little bit more about the Anti-10K Fest um, piece and then um, these other sort of performance walks, I call them. But I wanted to share my screen here. Um, I think I'm sharing my screen, right? <laughs> uh, no, you are now. Oh, okay. Yes. And I'm just going to go to um, the slideshow view. So this is a piece called If I Could Bring You Things You Never Had, which was done about six years ago, 2015. And it was essentially a project that uh, entailed walking. Sorry, this is. I didn't realize it was going to keep flipping over on me. Um, there you go. Um, it was a project that entailed me walking from Chicago to Urbana, Champaign, um, which is where the outhouse, if you're not familiar with the outhouse, it's a, an artist run space by uh, Albert Stabler, who um, I think, I'm not sure if he's there anymore, but he was doing his PhD work at the U of I. And so I was invited to exhibit there, and I had proposed to do this walk that would, you know, encompass about a 150 mile journey from Chicago down south, um, and you could kind of see the the route. 
that I'd taken. It's it's mostly rural sort of suburban areas uh, leading up to um, some major cornfields, of course. But interestingly enough, this is a project I'm sharing that was kind of a complete failure in the sense that I didn't quite make it and I had to be rescued um, two and a half days into the walk because um, he wanted me to, I, I was scheduled to arrive on a Sunday and, it, and I just was not gonna make it in time for their opening reception where I was gonna draw in the books that were contained inside this little trailer. So you can kind of see, um, I'll, I'll get into a little bit more information about why there's a convenience store, uh, groceries, um, I'm sorry, a gas station convenience store in this picture, but it entailed, you know, me walking through different rural areas and ultimately sort of enduring, I guess you could say, the elements because there was quite a big uh, rainstorm for a good day and a half um, and all sorts of mechanical issues and things that um, kind of just made this project completely fall apart. I mean, almost literally the handlebar of this contraption that I was pushing um, got loosened and the screw sort of fell off and broke. And so I was swiveling this thing that was significantly heavy. I mean, it had about 21 um, pretty heavy sketchbooks inside. So uh, if, if you could imagine trying to steer this thing through, well, you can't really see it in here, but <laughs> through, <laughs> through some rural roads that didn't have sidewalks in some cases um, through the rain and, and such. And I could go on about the misery of certain areas, but certain portions of the trip, but you can see that there's obviously some very nice moments um, with the exception of, you know, the sidewalk ending, <laughs> as you can see in this one. Okay, shall we? So I want to go back um, firstly to the first video that we showed, mm -hmm. uh, which is the, the 10K uh, race for Anti-Festival. And, you know, both the pieces that you shared are durational. One was a durational run and the other was a dur durational hike um, lasting several days. Can you share your thoughts on the differences and similarities between the athletic body and the performative body? And, and, how, and can you share about how these different approaches to caring for the body um, are, are present in, particularly in the anti-festival uh, mm -hmm. performance? Yeah, you know, I think I want to just sort of start that out by saying that um, my interest in running stems way back, you know, as a high school student, and maybe even before that, I'd always been interested in running. I've always been um, physically active, and so I participated in things like cross country and such in high school and competed. I wasn't very good, so when I say competing, you know, and that I was in a competitive sport, it it didn't really feel like it. And that's part of my <laughs> interest in, and you're talking about this athletic body. I think generally uh, we like to think of athletes and people who are in sports, I guess you can say, um, as having a very distinct goal of winning and, and this sort of attitude and mentality of uh, gamesmanship and, and, well, you know, competitors basically. And I'm not really a competitive person in that regard. So it, it's sort of a initial conflict of interest. But also with that, as, as an artist, as somebody who was genuinely interested in pursuing a career in the arts, um, I constantly was conflicted by those two sort of opposing worlds. You, you don't really find too many artists who are athletes and the worlds, of course, of jocks versus artists in school was <laughs> very, very prominent. Um, but of course there are exceptions and I definitely see myself as one and, and and I see myself as kind of a, uh, a person who is interested in creating those crossovers, those connections between two opposing forces. It's been what I've been interested in um, my entire life and my artistic pur pursuit. So 
getting people like if you if you, you recall looking at the video like who was competing or who was participating a lot of them were part of the anti-contemporary art festival so they were artists and it was fantastic to see both directors you know taking that on and as well as some of the artists who were performing during that weekend um you know some of them in, in a walking situation and others you know locals in in Kuopio, uh running and doing something that they do uh, just as a as a citizen, I guess you could say, and not necessarily there for the the contemporary art festival. So for me, it was exciting to, to create this sort of crossover between um, two sort of diametrically opposed forces, at least that, in, in my experience of that. And and there's a lot to be said. I think just that attempt. I think I sort of force myself into these situations that are high tension and. Um, maybe not comfortable and it's not about being com uncomfortable it's not some sort of masochistic um principle that that i'm trying to deal with it's more trying to gain a kind of understanding of of uh again this human condition of why we do certain things and why we um choose not to do other things um so when you combine uh, individuals and you sort of rely on their version or how they deal with it in this case if they're competing or not um if they're more interested in the poetry aspect of it um or the spectacle of it as opposed to the athletic endeavor those are the things that really kind of excite me so you know that's just the tip of the iceberg um and my i i just want to like are you thinking about you know i'm just intrigued personally like when you're prepping for you know um these running events for instance mm -hmm. you know and for marathons in particular there's a lot of training uh, that goes um that is involved you know there's a lot of care of the body you know just on a physical level mm -hmm. and are you thinking what are the um similarities or differences that you're seeing between the athletic body and the performative body are you thinking about those definitely and i'm, I'm glad you brought up that word training because i think that that's ultimately the um, the, the force that joins those two together, you know, and, and I didn't learn that really immediately. I didn't, I, I basically came to that understanding now in my forties, you know, uh, after having kind of kept those two worlds separate and it, it is about this routine. It is about kind of this, this, what some people might understand as finding a zone and, um, putting yourself into a place where, the rest of the world, the outside world sort of doesn't affect you. You're you're concentrating and focused on one thing. So in the case of drawing, for instance, um, I'm making marks on paper and I'm thinking about a lot about breathing so that I could formally produce certain kinds of marks and reacting back and forth um, from what I see on the paper and what what's kind of come out of my hand. Um, and with running, you're doing a very similar thing where you're you're basically reacting to the world around you and whether you're competing or not you know you're physically dealing with uh, the elements the world around you you know whether it's a sidewalk or a trail out in nature um, but you're constantly thinking about i wouldn't necessarily say a destination but there is some kind of outright goal that um, is incorporated into that mindset and um and I've found that they're almost, I go through the exact same processes. In fact, I've gotten over the, this last year during the pandemic, I've gotten into a routine where I'm doing my daily run and, you know, it's minimum one mile, maximum, you know, like six to eight miles uh, with an average of, you know, three or four each day. Um, and, ret and I return home to, to draw, you know, to start making marks. And then there's a kind of focus that, um, I'm seeking, you know, clarity mm -hmm. that happens when um, you return from something that involves a lot of circulation and breathing. Yeah, yeah so I think this, um, you know, and these kind of conjure up the, these ideas of uh, liminal spaces 
that I want to discuss with you. So it might be a good time to um, talk about the Aspen and perhaps the Florida um, durational pieces as well. Mm -hmm. But, you know, how are these performances operating in liminal spaces for you? And what defines the body and particularly your body in the context of these spaces? And yeah, that's... Um, well, so I think the, it's because everyone see, you can still see this. I can now, yes. So I think what I, I wanna, I feel like I, I'm sort of skipping ahead, but, um, oops, sorry. In terms of uh, timing, you know, the the Auntie 10K happened two years after some of these other previous hikes. And just as background, um, I'd been doing these walks that purposely put me in a place uh, between what I would consider the wilderness or the wild and some kind of civilization, something as basic as a road or a sidewalk. So I started um, with a walk in when I was in, in a residency in, in a rural farm area into town. And then that sort of blossomed into me walking from Lake Forest where I work, which is a, you know, a suburb of Chicago down into the city to my childhood home. Um, and then here, what you're looking at now, uh, it's titled There's Snow Getting Around It. It's, it's actually back in Snowmass Village, Colorado, kind of near Aspen. So it's a very, uh, you know, touristy sort of resort town that I had experienced uh, when I was working at Anderson Ranch Art Center. And <clears throat> it was it involved hiking up the mountain, you know, and then snowboarding down at the end and pretty much, you know, uh, going ex experiencing this the specific type of space of hiking up a mountain um in in a place that quite honestly i didn't really feel like i belonged um and again sort of purposely putting myself in a place where uh you probably wouldn't find me there typically <laughs> yeah interestingly enough like i've been in these places because of my interest in art and not necessarily because I can afford a, a ski pass or a vacation in, in Aspen. Um, and that's really ultimately what it comes down to, I think, is I've been trying to find these spaces that really talk about uh, these moments that we are enduring, at least that I'm enduring as a, as a brown person, um, someone with a, who looks like me, who comes from a background um, that that I have um, in a place where it's not typical, you know, it's not um, where you would typically find me. <laughs> um, so a lot of yes. the images that you're seeing here is, you know, me, it's metaphorically, I think my experience of being in a place that, I mean, I'll be quite frank, it's mostly white tourists, uh, people who inhabit a place like Aspen, which if you're not familiar with Aspen, of course, is, is tremendously wealthy. And so to be there hiking up a mountain as opposed to taking the ski lift was one of the things that I, I purposely wanted to experience. Um, but I think I thought long and hard about my entire experience with Colorado and just how just kind of how odd and bizarre it was for a kid like me who grew up in the city um, who romanticized the idea of, of nature. And, you know, when I was able to actually do it, it wasn't quite as, as, uh, as romantic as, as it appeared to be. Um, a lot of these images, you know, are influenced by maybe selfie culture, but more particularly uh, my interest in things like Patagonia catalogs and things that I sort of grew up with because I hadn't really traveled and experienced these until I was an adult. So as a child growing up and, and sort of immersing myself in outdoorsy culture, um, I always felt like I had to capture these kinds of moments that were portrayed in something like a a catalog, which of course has ties to consumerism and, and um, 
you know, catering to people who could afford the product and the gear. So um, a lot of my work when it comes to drawing has always been about referencing equipment, things like backpacks. And you could see a, a sort of even in these images, romanticized the, the sort of the pile of coats and, and straps and, you know, the, the ski pole and the helmet as a sort of a focal point in a particular type of landscape. Yeah, so now, you know, in in really thinking about, you know, placing your body, I mean, part of this series is talking about the body in sight. And with Out of Sight, we've had um, particular experiences over the last uh, 10 years when when um, artists um, who are black and brown are particularly targeted uh, by the police when they're performing with Out of Sight. And you know, this tension, um, you know, this explicit racism that, uh, that happens uh, when, um, you know, and the, these uncomfortable situations that arise. Can you share some of the stories or some of the moments that, it, that you've experienced in these situations? And how are you thinking about it as these liminal spaces that, and, you know, I'm really thinking about liminal in the sense of, you know, how can it create a transformation, you know, in, in these contexts yeah yeah it's a it's a tough one uh, that that entire idea of not feeling safe in a particular place for someone like me who's not black um but is also not white uh, it's an interesting place to be because i by no means did i ever really feel afraid <laughs> you know to be in here it's not like um you know i was hiking up this mountain uh, with all this gear and equipment, and I was afraid that someone was going to kick me off of the, the mountain. You know, it, it, it worked, you know, worse comes to worse to arrest me, or I didn't ever, you know, feel the uh, any kind of threat of physical harm. But, you know, it's, it's, uh, in, in this particular picture, I'm keeping it here because I'm right here by the ski lifts. And, you know, it was interesting to be in moments where I'm hiking, I'm sort of trudging up, focused on concentrating left foot in front of right and kind of getting into a meditative zone. When someone from the top of the ski lift, you know, looks just like this, because everybody looks like this when you're on the mountain and everyone else is on the lift, um, yelling down to you and saying, you know, that's what the lifts are for and, and sort of uh, making fun of you for doing what you're doing. And that's just, bare minimum of, I think, the emotional level of um, not feeling like you belong. Um, because if you want to talk more about, <laughs> you know, the way Aspen or Snowmass Village might make you feel, might make a brown person feel, then that's a whole other thing. Um, because it's a distinct sort of culture where, you know, the stuff that you wear, the stuff that you're, um, you're doing, all, all creates a particular type of identity that's um, that's either normal or not, and we could go into all sorts of um, multiple levels of, I guess you, you know racism. But I think for me, it's it's difficult to uh, get into a place where I where there's anything tragic. I guess you could say um, just because of who I am and what brought me there. But it does, you know, as as a, a brown person, I, I'll just say, you know, all of my experiences, the fact that I would, I chose Snowmass Village and Anderson Ranch and, um, you know, all of these sort of places that I guess you could say are beautiful and sort of magnificent in their uh, grand vistas. Uh, it was all because I chose to be an artist. It wasn't because I chose to live a particular type of lifestyle that, um, that catered to skiers and snowboarders and this apres ski culture. Um, and I quickly just showed these images of the walk that I did in Miami Beach where uh, it was a similar situation where I walked, it was probably about 35 miles total or close to 40. 
um, along the shore of Miami Beach, uh, heading up towards uh, Fort Lauderdale. But you have a string of hotels literally on the left of you. Um, and then to the right, to the east of you is pretty much ocean. And, and it was an interesting place to be where the tension is so much a part of the experience of walking because you're you're literally like I was saying in between um, this idea of nature and the wilderness um, or what is naturally occurring in the world and then this slew of construction I mean there's literally miles and miles of hotels being built I'm not really sure where <laughs> where the money is coming from and why they can stay in business but I guess there's just that many people who want to experience nature firsthand like that and be at the beach and so it's an interesting place for me to 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 want to also be in a place like that um, that I couldn't afford and that I was sort of limited to be navigating in between those two places. Because um, when you navigate between those two places, you're really residing in this place of tension where you're being drawn on one side um, and drawn to the other and knowing full well that there's kind of a underlying I don't know what you want to call it, but it's it's uh, it doesn't feel so good, you know, because you know it's it's all about money and it's about um, you know some sense of oppression for somebody else, you know, and and not necessarily being able to enjoy it the way it was intended to, um, because it was dictated by a particular population of people with that wealth. So. Uh, all you could do is walk, you know, all you could do is sort of cut through it and, um, and sort of move forward and stop and rest, you know, and, uh, and try to collect your bearings. And there's so many, I think, emotional factors that come into play that maybe didn't even exist back then when I did it, but are, as I look at these pictures, because, you know, these are 10, 15 years ago when I did it, um, and in this day and age with, you know, Ahmad Arbery um, getting killed um, on a run, you know, I've, it, it, it just changes the entire perspective for me on how, how, where, if I'm, if I should be, you know, walking through a particular space, um, if there's something um, that I'm risking by walking through these spaces, which no, typically or normally would be absolutely fine. Um, and, and I think that that ultimately impacts everything about how I, um, continue with, with the world and with the way I go about dealing with day-to-day, -day, uh, routines. Yeah. I mean, it's, it makes me, I mean, years ago I read an article about a cyclist i was into long i've done like border to border you know as a cyclist uh, i'm but i read this article about this person who tried to cycle coast to coast across mm -hmm. america and the violence that they received as a cyclist on the road and i know i was involved in the very first um in the second actually um bike critical uh, mass in chicago in 1997 i think it was and my friends um had been arrested on after the first critical mass cycle ride mm -hmm. and this violence that um people um ex experience and particularly brown and black bodies in america and you know the these um and it, the tension becomes heightened when you actually I mean, the irony is in some of these instances that the tension gets heightened when you go out of the inner city. Yeah. And can you, I know you have some recent particular experiences about that. And, you know, as an artist, 
you know, are you placing your body in sight and in specific in context? Um, can you, and I do, I'd like you kind of to discuss, you know, your relationship with nature and how this heightens the tension mm -hmm. um, that, that is being revealed in these durational performances. Well, I think I, I should, uh, can you still see my screen here? I've got this. Oh, image. no. Uh, there you go. Yeah. So there's just this image of, uh, this was not a performance. And, and I think it's important for me to talk a little bit about you bring up this idea of cycling and bicycling outside of an urban setting. This is nothing like critical mass. This was just a solo bike trip back in 2001. So this is pre 9-11 pre everything you know that we've been dealing with uh pre uh trump era and such and it was i think it's just important i wanted to talk a little bit about this because this was uh my initial foray into nature and and wanting to participate in this this, this sort of outdoors culture that um had been romanticized for me um through these catalogs and through basically white culture that i was so um, distinctly found, I distinctly found myself in, but it was one of these situations where, uh, I think I, I was what, maybe 26, I think. So I came into it a fairly naive, not necessarily understanding or wanting to know, uh, what it meant to have a body, a brown body in these rural areas. You know, I think a lot of the mindset of travel is that you know, you're one with nature, you're, you're gonna like live off the land, you're going to um, enjoy these majestic sort of moments where light and air and uh, your physical sort of presence is has become profound, you know, and, and this day and age, it just doesn't seem like I could ever do something like this and travel outside of the city <laughs> and ultimately be safe or feel safe. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, again, just all of the things that have, have come about. And I just want to make a point too, that uh, this happened, like I said, about 20 years ago, but um, I had no idea that, uh, so after my parents passed away, um, I was in a conversation with my sister who told me that, um, I, I'm not exactly even sure how this conversation about my bike trip came up, but she mentioned how how anxious my parents had gotten um, about me doing this trip, and um, and and how much strain I think it created. Of course, they never told me this. <laughs> I'm hearing this uh, long after they're gone, but um, it really bothered me to think of. The sort of the pain and suffering that uh, I created by doing something like this, um, you know, it's just like I, I thought to myself, well, this is what people do, you know, when they want to um, experience the world. This is what they do when they um, want to be one with the land, one with nature. But it's such a privileged uh, idea and concept, and I think I was very naive to. Um, to want to pursue that without this sense of risk or fear, you know, and then this idea of fear, you know, having only your body to, to sort of um, defend yourself is, 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 is such a, an interesting place to be because you're, you're completely vulnerable in a place like this, in a situation like this, but you choose to put yourself into it. Um, without fully understanding really what the repercussions are of the rest of the world. So, and like I said, you know, this happened well before a lot of the current events have happened, but, you know, lynchings and attacks on colored people have been happening for hundreds of years. It's not like, oh, I finally learned that it's not safe to do this. Um, but having said that, you know, it's, uh, it was, relatively safe. Like I, I actually did not encounter anything that would make you say something like, 
oh, all the people on rural areas are 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 terrible and they're racist and they're going to uh, attack you because you're there by yourself. You know, it it me wearing this gear, having this equipment, I mean, it creates this kind of privilege in its own right of, you know, looking kind of the part. And it's, again, it's going to be totally different for a Black person. It's going to be totally different for uh, another person who doesn't look like me, who might not look like me. Um, even though I'm not white, I kind of like sort of sitting in the middle between um, uh, something that would stand out completely. Um, so it's an interesting place to be. Like, I think about this constantly, you know, to find myself trying to relate to the white experience, really, uh, forcing myself to do these things that I know white people like to do, you know, that, that at least that I understood culturally uh, is something that you do after graduate school, what you do, things that you do in transition, things that you do because you have money, you know, <laughs> such a hard part to, to learn. It's, it's uh, none of this was really feasible. I just sort of used up all the money that I had to do it. And uh, it, it sort of tainted my idea of what nature was because uh, it wasn't, it didn't reveal ultimately all of the things that I was expecting. And it was a very naive uh, attitude, I think, to have. I sort of skipped around your question there, I think, but. <laughs> I'm sorry, Karen, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry, I typed. Uh, we got some lovely comments in the chat, so I, I responded, so I put myself on mute. Uh, but I was just asking, could you go into, would you be interested in sharing more deeply about what your expectations and perhaps, you know, um, thinking about this um, exclusivity and elitism when it comes to accessing nature in particularly in America it's um, you know there's always a cost involved uh, I think it ultimately comes down to that you know and that's um, the one thing that I think everybody can understand that's sort of a universal understanding it's like oh if you have money you can do anything at least that's the general um, mindset. And so this idea of connecting with nature, you know, when you talk about who was here first and, and the sort of the indigenous attitude of, of how we relate to nature and how we're not consuming it, it's actually part of uh, a much more reciprocal sort of symbiotic relationship as opposed to a consumerist capitalistic mindset, then, then it's a completely shifted um, attitude because I, you know, my my initial foray into the outdoor culture was so predicated on the fact that, or it was portrayed by a capitalist structure. You know, it was it, it was presented to me through REI and Patagonia. You know, because they wanted to sell stuff, and this idea of you needing to be surrounded by certain equipment, certain access to things, to objects, stuff, you know, material stuff, which by the way is made by other um, other cultures, you know, so that they can experience these sort of uh, uh, moments in nature that essentially you should be able to do for free has completely negated uh, that ability. And so it becomes this almost ridiculous scenario where you're attempting to live a kind of lifestyle that just was not intended to be lived you know it's it's i'm not working and having a job so that i could buy equipment so that i could buy experience nature the way these other people have portrayed it you know um we're not employed in order to do that, we're employed because some somebody who had money basically needs people to 
do shit for them, <laughs> you know, it's, and, and they don't want to do it. They, you know, they'll, you know, that touches upon. Well, it, it their, feeds into this capital system of slavery that, has, just gonna say, uh, yes. that yeah. has been constructed internationally yeah. uh, through um, capitalism, capitalist consumerism. But, you know, I was interested, you know, through the pandemic, you know, one of the things that we could do outdoors was go for walks. Yeah. <laughs> and um, me and my friend got in the car one day and we were trying to find places outside of the city where we could go for a long hike. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I was looked on the map i found a green spot with some lakes and we headed out there and we're driving down the road and it says you know i don't know um forest preserve and you actually mentioned it the other day in our talk that mm -hmm. you went there quite recently and it cost like 25 dollars to just get in yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. and so we were like oh no you know you know um you know i grew up in areas where you could just you you know you walk out the door you go for a hike you mm -hmm. go to the woods you know it was there was a liberty and there was a freedom and you yeah. know i think and people have fought for that uh liberty and free walk paths and etc and you know there's actual legislation in the uk that um actually designates um free walking passes on land and if if a farmer tries to restrict that then there's a huge campaign to uh make it uh free for everyone right, right. so we are you know this goes back to this these questions of ownership of land yeah. that is so designate that has been so controlled in america and, and i think ownership and uh the sense of property this idea of property how people define it um in this day and age has become kind of it's been the main detrimental force that's uh affected everything you know why we do all the terrible things that we do uh because of this idea of ownership and claiming something um that you physically cannot contain and physically cannot own um yet insist on you know trying to tame or control and i think that if you think about historically manifest destiny and and sort of even like the building of the interstate system you know, and being able to to travel across the country. It's, it's such a privilege and a luxury, but it was set with like some very terrible sort of goals initially is to get, you know, during the, the Cold War to, to make sure we can get our military out to the West Coast if the Russians decided to attack, you know, and it's just like, we need roads, we need to, and then, you know, you kind of mask it through, um, like experiencing national parks and these tourist sites. So there becomes this whole other level of uh, embeddedness that we have in the experience of nature that masks the sort of underlying hidden truth of, oh my gosh, this is a terrible thing. <laughs> you know, we're, we're wreaking havoc upon the landscape so that we can ensure that the Russians don't take over or that, you know, this other, um, you know, these people from another side don't enter our space, and and it, it and you see that in everything from borders and from the interstate system and access to those things to your, your backyard and the fences that you put up um, and the sort of the resistance against what you're talking about this idea that you can walk through anybody's sort of farm or I don't know what the exact word or what what is the the word for that. Isn't it like a F farmland? Or... No, no, the, the the actual the the law that allows you to walk in other people's farms or the P 
pedestrian right of way or something like that. Uh, yeah. I think. <laughs> you know, I there's a couple of um responses and questions in the chat that i want to bring up for you uh paulina um says i she doesn't have a question but she did want to articulate appreciation oh. for regin and his wonderful work and um sophia is asking the artist appears to be performing smooth consciousness in straciated spaces why does this result in discomfort? Um, how does the artist think about flow consciousness as in running in connection with smooth, de um, deteriorized per de loose con consciousness? It, it, well, it's interesting, you know, like with running and it's sort of this movement, which I'm very interested in this, just the like the literal movement through a particular space through a landscape. You know, if I wanted to be uh, uh, try to sell it in a magazine, as I, you know, growing up running and learning about the sport and the activity, it'd be like, how do I experience the forest and the woods and trail running? You know, and and kind of get to this level, this flow, maybe that you're talking about of uh, a symbiotic relationship with nature. But it it's so hard to do that these days. I don't I don't think that. Um, even the running events and such, it's become so commercialized and has evolved into this point where um, it's about somebody else making money. And so there's some kind of level of taintedness uh, that does not allow me to um, be very comfortable ever, which is, I think it's an unfortunate thing, but um, unless... Uh, you know, from the way things are moving, when I, when I talk about running events, you know, the anti 10 k is a perfect example. Um, that whole system that was set up for racing is, is intended to, to time people accurately. And, and they created a chip so that they could keep track of everybody. I mean, there's a certain level of control um, that's very practical because it is about a competitive race, but it's also, you know, it costs a lot to put together something like that. Um, you need to bring the police in to close off streets, typically. Um, you need to shut down the city to organize a marathon. And those things, while it might seem exciting and fabulous, and believe me, like I've been part of that for many years, that's sort of the culture of running, it, it oppresses somebody else. You know, It affects somebody's uh, daily routine. I've heard more than once that, you know, I couldn't get to work because of that damn marathon, you know, or uh, when I think of running, like how many of those like cups are, are being like thrown out and affecting the environment, even though there's an argument that a lot of things are, rest, are, are being recycled. But more, I think on a deeper level, I think I would talk about my daily runs where, for instance, I'm walking... I'm running to the local park where I usually sort of cut through. And this is in the middle of a below six degree day in the morning, seven o'clock. And there are those guys, those day laborers sitting in front of the diner that's right by the park waiting to get work. And there's no way that you could not be affected by trying to pursue some kind of activity like a run and not think about this other thing that's going on in the world. So unless you're going to run somewhere where you're not in contact with anybody or any sense of civilization, it's really difficult, I think, to, to not feel that discomfort. Um, I think there's another uh, comment, you know, from Sophia saying uh, she gets a strong sense of economic reductionism here. But I don't think it's, uh, we're not talking about reductionism. Uh, we're talking about uh, different per perceptions of how um, people have access to nature mm -hmm. and how, you know, and how different um economic structures are created in europe and versus in the us mm -hmm. uh, for people to actually access uh, natural uh, 
and experience the wonders right. of nature, which is so um, essential for human human sanity and consciousness, as you right. mentioned earlier. Um, I we're getting. I want to be very respectful of people's time because we're up to uh, one hour. But I just want to uh, summarize uh, some of what we've talked about here today. Uh, we started the conversation talking about uh, the differences and the similarities between the athletic body and the performative body and the, tr the routines and the training that is um, really part of that process. And then Regin actually talked about the issues of safety for um, brown bodies, brown and black bodies in, um, in these elitist uh, white uh, resorts uh, of, that are, you know, that do require a lot of economic wealth to access and how that actually is an additional barrier uh, to creating these um, these segregated sp spaces in our in the US, which kind of feeds into div divisionism and actually um, increases the lack of safety for all of us. I mean, that is the, the manifestation of that. And, well, that's my opinion of that. <laughs> so, um, but there are, uh, there's research to show that. Um, and he, we also talked about um, accessing nature and the importance of that uh, for the body. I also want to um, highlight and share with everybody that we have um, we have a so from April twenty second to May ninth, we have a public performance festival entitled um flow in body in sight so i do hope you will think about purchasing an early bird ticket for that we're very excited to announce that alistair mcclellan uh, will be one of the presenters um at the public performance symposia along with a really a stellar lineup of international artists so um Please um, you know, investigate that and we'll be uh, sharing more details about that through the Arctis Focus series as the weeks go on. And I want to thank you all for joining us here today. It's been a great pleasure to talk with you, Regin, about your durational performance works and you know, wish you all the best in uh, your future at creative activities. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all for taking part. Thank you.